Well, we want to continue worshiping by reading God's Word together. And so if you have a copy of the Bible, and I hope that you do, if you do not, you may want to grab one in the back of the room at the resource table. But we're going to be in the book of Amos. Next four weeks, we're going to be in the book of Amos, looking at one of what we would refer to as the minor prophets of God. And so I want you to know as you're turning there, I, I'm looking forward to this series um, and, and one of the only reasons you might choose to preach or go through as a congregation, the minor prophets, uh, they don't naturally read as easily as the New Testament or maybe even the Gospels, is you go there because God leads you there. And so he's led me there, and I believe he wants us to spend the next four weeks in the book of Amos. I'm excited about it, but I'm also mindful of how heavy and how um, difficult and challenging it is to, to unpack the, the historical context of something that was taking place thousands of years ago, as well as, by the way, when you're reading the minor prophets, any prophets, prophets were always called and raised up by God to call the people to return to him. And so sometimes they speak very boldly, they speak very bluntly, and it is sometimes offensive to our flesh. Uh, it is the 4th of July. We're so grateful that you're here. I don't know how many of you are going to see fireworks. Uh, I, I, I saw some fireworks last night, and I wrestle with that in my spirit. Like, it's the 3rd. It's not really the 4th. Am I celebrating the 4th if it's not on the 4th? Um, so I'm going to double dip and go and see some fireworks tonight, whichever way you choose to celebrate. I'm mindful of a time um, a while back when my grandparents were still alive, and they took me downtown to see fireworks, and we went expecting uh, a show of power and the visionary displays of those colors popping, and it was awesome, and I mean like in an overwhelming way, it was awesome, the colors and the brilliance of it. Um, many of the fireworks, I think the way it was set up, they, they went off before probably their optimum height, and so it was a lot closer to us, and you could literally almost feel the concussion from them, and you could hear it and see it, and you almost kind of had to wince, and I don't think my grandparents really enjoyed it, because the whole time I was just standing there with my jaws open, every time I'd glance up, they were like this, and, and so... Um, it was beautiful, and it was awesome, and it was, it was true. It was spot on, but it was kind of up in your face, and it, it rattled you. You could feel it in your body. Now, the reason I share that with you is I hope no one has that type of fireworks experience tonight, but that's really how it is sometimes when you come to the Minor Prophets. It's true. It's spot on. It is so important to see, hear, and experience but it can get up in your business. It can rattle your cage. It can offend your flesh and shock your sensibilities. But one of the things that I've been so mindful of, and we need a steady diet, not just from the New Testament and the Old Testament, the full complement of God's Word, is because He wants us to know His heart for people and what He intends to unfold while we're living here on this earth. And one of the best ways we can do that is by spending time in the book of Amos over the next four weeks. Let me invite you to stand along with me in honor of God's word. Let me remind you that the reason we do this is to acknowledge God is holy. He is sinless. He is righteous. That's a word I'm going to use quite often today as we read the text. That means he's perfect. And he's holy and he's God and there's no one like him. That's why we stand in honor of him. I want you to keep your Bibles open to chapters 1 and 2 today, but we're going to read the first two verses of chapter 1. It says, The words of Amos, who was one of the sheep breeders from Tekoa, and what he saw regarding Israel in the days of King Uzziah of Judah and King Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. He said, the Lord roars from Zion and makes his voice heard from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds mourn and the summit of Mount Carmel withers. Amos said in verse 2, as the mouthpiece of the Lord, the Lord roars from Zion. And as he makes his voice heard from Jerusalem, the pastures weep and mourn. And even the summits of the highest places wither or fail and shake in their place. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the full complement of Scripture, the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Gospel writers, the minor prophets, the major prophets. All of your word is important. All of it is living and active and applicable to our lives in 2021. And there are no errors and you do not contradict yourself. I pray that you would speak through your prophet Amos to the church at Avenue South, quicken our hearts and minds for what it is you want us to know, 
And if we are offended, if you wound our flesh, Lord, I pray that we would remember Proverbs 27, 6. The wounds of a friend can be trusted, that you will use even difficult truths to pull your church back closer to you. Please do that this morning. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, one of the things I think is incredibly important for us is to realize the prophet, the mouthpiece of God from whom we're hearing from this morning. As I mentioned, I know many of us may not spend a lot of time in the historical context of Amos or who he was or what's happening, but Amos is a prophet. Uh, He lived at this point in Judah, which was the southern kingdom of God's people. Historically, this all happens almost 3,000 years before the birth of Christ. The kingdom of God, God's people, had been split into two kingdoms. There was Israel in the north and Judah in the south. And he was from Tekoa, that's the hill country just south of Jerusalem in Judah. God called him. Prophets don't ask to be prophets. God calls them to be his messengers and his mouthpiece. Now, the reason they don't choose to be prophets is because oftentimes what they have to say is harsh and difficult and shocking. Now, I mentioned just a moment ago that that's the reality of Amos. I mean, oftentimes, if you're going to build a church and say, our our number one metric of how successful we are is Sunday morning attendance. And you know that's not my heart, never has been. That is one metric, but if it's just about being seeker sensitive and we just want to pack the chairs and have as many services as we can, you don't preach or lead a congregation through Amos because it's difficult to understand and it is sometimes offensive. I think as Westerners, as Christian Westerners, we can be, even as followers of God, we can be stubborn and we can be arrogant and we can be prideful and selfish. And so if you want and we want to have a church that understands the heart of God and ask ourselves, are we most definitely in a right relationship with him, then you definitely go through Amos together. Amos was from Judah. He shows up in Israel, the northern kingdom, as a prophet. It would be much like when he shows up to say, this is God's word for you. It would be much like somebody from New Orleans or from Houston, somewhere far south of us in a different place, showing up with a word for Nashville, most not likely accepted or celebrated when he shows up on the scene. But when he does, one of the first things he does is prophets often announce judgment. This is what's been going on, and God's not going to put up with it any longer. And so you would assume he's going to show up, and he's sent to Israel, so he's going to start with Israel. But he doesn't do that. One of the things I want you to see is I want you to read chapters 1 and 2 this week. I've prayed and wrestled with how to unpack this to help us understand the history of it, but also not to confuse us or get us lost looking back down and looking up again while we're together in this moment. And so I want you to read the fullness of chapters 1 and 2 without any distraction or interruption this week. And what you will notice is when he shows up to Israel, he begins by prophesying judgment against the surrounding nations, the neighboring nations of Israel. There were seven neighboring nations. Six of them were pagan. They were not God's people. They didn't worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The seventh one is Judah, which is where he's from. And they were God's people, but they are one of the seven nations or groups of people that he begins prophesying against. And one of the things you're going to notice, I just want to show you a type or a theme when he pronounces judgment that you're going to see. Look in verse 3. Amos says this, the Lord says, I will not relent, like I will not stop, I will not delay from punishing Damascus. Now, that's just one of the neighboring nations. As you read through, you'll see verse 6, I will not relent from punishing Gaza. That's the second one. Verse 9, I will not relent from punishing Tyre. Verse 11, I will not relent from punishing Edom. Verse 13, I will not relent from punishing Ammon or the Ammonites. Chapter 2, verse 1, I will not relent from punishing Moab. Chapter 2, verse 4, here's Judah. These are his people, but they're one of the seven nations he's judging. The Lord says, I will not relent from punishing Judah. So as you read this week, you will see there are seven neighboring nations around Israel where God says, I have seen what you've been doing and I'm finished with my patience, I will wait no longer in passing judgment on you. And in each of these pronouncements, God says, I will not relent from three crimes or even four. And so what that means is I have been patient. I've watched you do things that are not right. They're not just. 
So let's talk about him addressing and passing judgment on pagan nations that were not his people. He says, I have been patient. I have waited long enough, and I've observed your violence, your evil, and especially your injustice toward other humans. You know, if there's something you read from Amos or the Minor Prophets, one of the themes is that nothing seems to grab the attention of God and stir up his righteous anger more than atrocity against humans. It's one of the themes of Amos. There seems to be very few things that gets God's attention quicker than human atrocity, especially violence against fellow image bearers. Now, what I mean there is that Scripture is very clear, particularly Psalm 139 is a great place to learn about this. Every human is created in the image of God. That means regardless of what the cultural standard of beauty or worth may be, God says every life, every human matters. Every life has dignity. Every life has worth. Every life has value, not because a pastor said it this Sunday or because someone else said it, but because God has declared it so. And that's everybody past that's ever lived, that's the 8 billion people living now, and any life to come in the future, every life has dignity and worth and value. And so in each of these seven pronouncements, especially these six to these pagan nations, God is addressing humans being violent to other humans. Now, I won't elaborate on all of them, but for instance, one of the first ones, Damascus. I'm going to punish your sin of unjust treatment towards other image bearers because you threshed Gilead with iron sledges. Now, this is not your favorite Sunday school story, but that literally means that when they would move in and occupy another land, they literally, in a place called Gilead, kind of took over, and they took farming equipment like plows with metal blades on it, and they farmed over people. And one of the reasons you do that is to show I'm bigger, I'm badder, we're stronger, we're better than you, and we will treat you this way so that you don't rise up against us. By fear, they would lead, but they also seemed to enjoy inflicting violence on others. Now, God does that. He says that as he judges these nations. He says that about Damascus. If you were to go on and read, you'd see when he calls out Gaza and Tyre, another nation, he says, you capture people from neighboring communities and you sell them into the slave trade. I am not pleased with this. He keeps going on. Edom, you are vindictive in your hatred with no compassion to others, and you inflict violence on others. Now, in chapter 2, he says to Moab, like, you desecrate tombs. You have no respect for the dignity of life. And finally, when he talks to Judah, his own people, he says, I'm lumping you in here. And you know what? Your sin is that you have forsaken me, and you're worshiping false idols. Like, it goes on and on and on, but the summary here that we need to remember is that God is not pleased with violence from image bearers against image bearers. Now, this is over 2,700 years ago. Um, It feels like a long time ago, and so you may ask, what is the application? Like, is it applicable? And it's it's as contemporary um, as you could possibly fathom in our day and age. One of the things he says, let me just give you one example. We won't spend a lot of time here, but when you think about this, you're like, what does that have to do with us? I want you to think about something here. In chapter 1, verse 13, when he says, I will not relent from punishing Ammon, his judgment against them is this. When you move into other lands, especially Gilead, you ripped open the pregnant women of Gilead in order to enlarge your territory. In other words, when they would conquer a new land, if any woman was pregnant or got pregnant, They would remove the child so that that child could not grow up to be a soldier against them from a neighboring nation or could not grow up to be a woman to serve in that community and would not be a threat to them. The Lord says, I am not pleased with violence against image bearers, and I am most definitely, he calls it out. And every time he calls out one of these sins, this is just like the final straw for each of these nations. This is it. He says, you kill the unborn. And I am not pleased with this. Now, I want you to think about this for just a moment. Psalm 139 says, You were created and knit together in your mother's womb, and from conception, life begins at conception. I want you to think about where we are with this, and I want to acknowledge that any time that we would talk about the loss of a child or the intentional removal of a child, I know there's some children in the room, so I will say the act of abortion, but I want to, to be mindful of the audience we have, the youngest to the oldest. I also want to be very mindful. I ask any of our communicators, anytime you preach on Psalm 139, or anytime you talk about advocacy of the unborn, 
you and I, our staff, we need to be mindful. When I say this this morning, there may be statistically a woman that's in our room or watching online that's had an abortion. Doesn't mean we don't acknowledge that or talk about it, but a I want you to hear me say as your pastor, I want to be a, as compassionate and tactful and not callous or cavalier with talking about this. Hold that thought for just a moment. Do you, do you know what Amos did for a living? You know what he did for a living? He was a, he was a shepherd. Did you see that? Like, he didn't go to seminary. He didn't grow up like the son of a great prophet. Like, I've been training for this my whole life. He's like, God called me, so here I am. And by the way, I just left my flock out in the field. Like, he's so not qualified. Have you ever been called to something, a mission trip or somewhere else, and you're like, why does he want to use me? It's because then you know it's God speaking and working in and through you, it ain't you. He's a shepherd. And one of the things I'm mindful of is, is we need to hear truth from God's word, especially if it's not culturally acceptable, but it's still his truth for his people. We need to call a spade a spade, but I need to do it. We need to do that in our small groups and our Bible studies with a shepherding, pastoral touch of compassion and love. I believe that's one of the reasons he chose Amos, to deliver such a hard truth. He says, I, I am not pleased with the taking of these unborn lives, and, and God is not pleased. With the act of abortion, how, how could he, as we pray, some of us with the same breath, Lord, bless and increase our nation, and a nation that condones that. He is not pleased. We will answer for that as a nation. Now, what I want you to know as you hear me say that is that you may have a lot of thoughts about somebody who's walked that journey until it hits close to home or you experience that personally. So our place is not judgment as, as a people. Our place is to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And if you have walked that road and you need any resources, you need any help, you need any assistance in terms of compassion and kindness and people to listen without any judgment whatsoever, you've come to a church that wants to live that way, behave that way, and love you well. And my prayer is that if you ever get pregnant unexpectedly and you are scared out of your mind, fearful of what your parents might think, fearful of the cost, I plead you to reach out to someone on our staff or someone that loves you in the name of Jesus so that they can walk alongside you with that. Now listen, we ought not also be pro-life and call it a sin, but we, we also need to not only say this is God's heart, but we need to be advocates in what we do, not just say. Our brother James said, faith without works is dead. So you and I not only need to say, please have that baby, Please choose life, not only from conception, but to end of life, we need to care for every image bearer. This is the elderly. This is the unborn. Now, now listen, the reason we need to do this is this is God's heart. And so what he's saying to these nations is what you're doing is unjust. It's not up to my standard. Now, why can God do that? Hold on just a second. Why can he say that? One of the things that you and I need to understand is that God is so unlike us. Mackenzie mentioned that as we sung. He is unlike us in that he's perfect, he's holy, he's never made a mistake. He is righteous and other than us. And so when he says, here's my standard, every life matters and you will honor them, he gets to make that declaration. And so therefore, as his people, anytime we see something that is not right or not just, we say this is his standard, and we want to be advocates of that. Now, one of the best illustrations to help us understand what justice is, does God care about injustice? Of course. How do we promote and pursue that? Well, one of the things God does is he says, I will establish upon my character and my righteousness what is just. So I don't know if you've ever seen somebody like a contractor or somebody building a building, but they will often start with what we call a plumb line. They'll start with a plumb line, and usually what they'll do is they'll hang a line, a string. This is like a, a plumb line with a weight at the end of it. And they'll hang a string from a fixed point. Usually they'll drive a stake in the ground, stick a little nail out, and hang the plumb line. And so what that means is even if the stake is off, but the plumb line hangs, it, I mean, it doesn't hang sideways, it's right there, it's level. And so what they will literally do is they will build the edge, they will set the first stone of a building along that plumb line so that it's correct, it's the right standard, it's built on something that can be trusted and stable. And then they will stack every other stone or line it out along both sides of the building and all four sides upon that cornerstone or that first place. Now, I intentionally chose a picture here that shows you that building ain't plumb. 
Like that building, even if just a little bit off, is off. Neil Armstrong said, we can be a foot off when we land on the moon, but if we're an inch off at earth, we will miss the moon by miles. If you're off, you're off. It doesn't matter if it's a mile. It doesn't matter if it's an inch. And so they will set a plumb line to build the building to say this is the standard. Justice is rooted in the character of God, which is right and righteous. So when God says, this is my righteousness and this is my standard for living, then we have the right standard to build upon and to say what is right and what is just. And he even said through the prophet Isaiah, Look, I've laid a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. The one who believes in the cornerstone will be unshakable, and I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the mason or the bricklayer's level. That's Isaiah talking about Jesus. That God has established justice upon his righteousness, which the best representation of that is Jesus himself. We are sinners and we deserve from birth, no matter how cute and cuddly we are, we deserve punishment for our sin and our transgressions. But through Christ, who lived a perfect sinless life, Jesus goes to the cross. God punishes him. God punishes him. God gets justice to punish and condemn the sin of us on Jesus. At the cross, God got justice and we received righteousness. So that when you and I profess our faith, then no matter what your story is, what your past is, if you came here this morning and as we're elaborating on some of the examples I've used about what's unjust, if you say, I I want to turn from my sin and myself or previous decisions and I want to turn to God through your faith in Jesus, that sin has been dealt with and you can be justified just as if you'd never sinned and you can be covered almost like with a righteous robe of Christ. So that when God looks at you from salvation forward, the rest of your life, he doesn't see your past. He doesn't see sins that maybe you can't forget about, although they're forgiven. He sees his character and his son in you and says, you belong to me. And we get to spend the rest of our lives building a life together. Fresh starts, do-overs, eternal life. Not only in this life, peace and joy and, and all of the things God brings along with salvation, but in the life to come. That's why God can say what's just, what's right, and what's wrong, and how the world should behave, whether they're his people or not. Six of these nations, they're pagan. They don't claim to worship him, but they still are under the righteous standard of the God of the universe who made them and created them. And when God says, this is my standard, he calls people, even pagan nations, to live under it, and they'll answer for it. Now, I bet while Amos shows up in Israel and starts laying it on to these other seven neighboring nations, I bet the people of Israel, you know, I mean, I bet they like that. These other nations, I mean, they're nasty, like, evil people. I bet they were like, yes, we like this guy, Amos. He showed up, and he's laying the smack down on our neighbors. This is phenomenal. Keep going. Keep going, buddy. And sometimes when somebody else gets what they have coming, have you ever? You don't have to. Don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. But have you ever been like, yes, Lord, yes, what, what's interesting is this. If you pulled up a map and you looked at, follow my hands like the hands of a clock, Damascus and Tyre and Edom and Ammon and Judah and Gaza, it's like the numbers on a clock. And geographically on a map, it literally, if you look at it, is like a bullseye. And guess who sits in the center of that bullseye? It's Israel. So the whole time they're like, yeah, this is good stuff. Like, yeah, let them have it. Amos says, and by the way, let's leave Judah out because they were his people, but they had given into idolatry. So they were going to be judged for that. These other six nations that are pagan, they don't claim me as God. So I suppose we could say, these are my words, not Amos. They didn't know better. Should have known better. They're still accountable for their actions. Every human, whether they claim Jesus is Lord or not, will bend the knee and will profess with their lips that Jesus is Lord of the glory of God the Father. Everybody will, past, present, and future. But he says, but y'all ought to know better. Y'all are my people. If there's anybody who ought to live justly and based on my righteousness, by the way, if any of us, 2021, have experienced 
If we've received the righteousness of God through the person of Jesus Christ, it ought to be the people who have experienced that righteousness who ought to be about advocating for the justice of God. And he says, but y'all don't do that. And by the way, you know, he only lists when he says, I've, I've waited, I've waited, but here's the final sin. There's, there's the straw that broke the back here. And he, and he names those against those other nations. When he comes to Israel, he don't name just the final sin. He names them all. If you still have your Bible open, when we look at verse 6, the Lord says, I will not relent from punishing Israel for three crimes, even four, because number one, you sell a righteous person for silver. That means someone who owes you money, they can't pay it back immediately, so you sell them into debt slavery. You sell a needy person for a pair of sandals. If they owe you a sandal, and a sandal also meant property. It represented like the foot that you used to walk on land. If they owe you money, you sell them. You obstruct the path of the needy. You make it hard on the poor people to get justice. You have allowed the courts and the system of legal proceedings to collude together to make it harder. You trample the heads of the poor. Look at what it says in verse 7. This is going from the legal representation. Take advantage of the poor. There's a man and his father that have sexual relations with the same girl, most likely a temple prostitute. There's un believable sexual immorality among you. You stretch out in verse 8 beside every altar on garments taken as collateral. Like you steal people's garments because they can't pay you back. So they say, that you say, give me that. And then you even lay it on the ground while you sleep with these people, most likely in plain view of everybody. And he goes on and on. And, and by the way, the wine that you drink for your idol worship, like you bought that wine in verse 8 off of the overtaxation of the poor. What is wrong with you, Amos says? If anybody ought to know, it's you. Yet I destroyed the Amorite as Israel advanced. The Amorites who stood in the promised land before you got there were like cedars, and his height was sturdy as the oaks in verse 9. But I destroyed his fruit above, and I uprooted him out of your way. Verse 10, I brought you from the land of Egypt. I led you 40 years in the wilderness in order to possess the land that you have set up shop in right now. I even raised up some of your sons as prophets, that means leaders, to tell you what was right. And some of your young men as Nazarites. Is this not the case? Didn't I do this for you? But you made the Nazarites, you, 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 you intimidated them into breaking their vows by drinking wine, and you commanded the prophets, do not prophesy. Don't say what God wants you to say, because we really don't want to hear it. Let's pause right there, and everybody look up here for just a minute. In other words, when he judges the surrounding neighbors, he lists one thing. And when he gets to God's people, he reminds them of everything they're doing that's unjust Number one, God's people are not exempt from accountability for their behavior and actions. That's us too. But he also says, but y'all ought to know better. Amos says, what, is, it, is this not the people that God parted the Red Sea to, to lead you out of slavery? You were enslaved for how many decades? How many years? And the Lord finally responded because you begged him to help you? You were oppressed, you were mistreated, you were abused. Are y'all the same people that have forgotten what it feels like to be under oppression that now in a time of wealth and prosperity you take advantage of the poor? Like, are y'all the same people? Are y'all the same people that the Lord went ahead of you in the promised land and uprooted every obstacle to say, I've paved the way for you. And when you get there, and this for Israel was a time of great prosperity and great wealth. And by the way, if you live in North America, you're in the top 5 to 7% of affluence in the world. You are. It just is what it is. Like, is this, it's a time of, of prosperity nationally and, and wealth, and like, and you're not any more generous with your stuff than you were before. By the way, you think oftentimes if I get money, if I get that job, it'll make me more generous, I'll have more resources. Oftentimes, if you don't have the character to sustain those things, those things make you more of what you may already be, which is perhaps greedy or tempted to indulge and to be selfish. He says, is this not the people that are supposed to look out for the poor, that are supposed to help those in need? Like, the problem here, folks, is that God did not call Damascus and Tyre and Sidon and Gaza and Edom and Ammon to be his people. He called the Israelites to be his people. Come, be set apart, 
be like me. I'm holy. I'm righteous. So you be righteous. Build your lives and how you act and how you behave and how you look out for people and how you advocate for those who have no voice for themselves. Build that upon my character so when the world looks at you, they say, who is their God that treats people with such dignity and respect and care and concern and compassion? I want to know their God. That's what I called y'all to do, but if people looked at you, they'd think you look just like these pagan nations. Can you imagine how grieved God's heart was? Like, if people looked at you to see who your God is, can you imagine what they think of me as your God? Like, think about how sad and grieved God's heart must have been. He said, y'all know better. You know better. You know, when, when you read this, one of the things that, like, if we stopped right there, like, that, that is, um, I don't know if anybody would leave and say, church was awesome today. It was so uplifting. Pastor killed it. It was great. When you preach the minor prophets, I don't think you ever walk away saying, that, that felt good. <laughs> it's a good word today. Like, you don't. But you and I need the words that are easy and palatable and also those that, because God loves you, he would say, if you're mine, do what's just. So there may be somebody in the room that's like, I, I, I truly believe I'm in a right relationship with God. I'm trying to do what's just and what's right and advocate for those who do not have those opportunities. I want to advocate for justice because of the righteousness of God I've received in Christ. And, and so maybe today you may pray and you may say in response to this, what a stark reminder. I want to continue to be about the things you're about. Maybe, maybe that's how you leave here today. I think that would be a wonderful prayer for all of us to say, we want your heart and your character. So when people look at the way we behave justly to others, they want to know who our God is that treats people like that. So maybe that's it. If God has blessed you tremendously, but you are selfish or you are not generous, or matter of fact, this is between you and God, you, you leverage things for your advantage, and maybe you can even identify a few places you've taken advantage. You've done unjust things to the poor, the marginalized. Maybe you've done something sinful towards another human, and you say, oh my gosh, like he says, I have waited for three sins, I've waited for four sins, no more. Listen, our God is very patient. You might read this and be like, oh, he's coming in hot. But he, he waited and waited, wanting them to repent and turn back towards him. I think you're going to love it in a couple of weeks when, when the emphasis of the sermon is seek me and live. That sounds so much better than what this does, right? That's what the third week's about. And, and it boils down to this. If you'll seek me and be about my things, you'll flourish and live. But if you don't, it'll bring about your ruin so maybe for any of us in the room, we need to say, Lord, I repent of sinfulness. I repent of mistreating someone. I have not been generous. I have not done what you've called me to do. This is always an invitation from the minor prophets to repent of our sin and self. And even if you're like, I don't even, I can't name something, Aaron. Like, I think I'm a, you and I just need to repent that we are sinful in our flesh and what we want is more what we want. And there's no one like you and I want a heart like you. Maybe we repent of that and ask him to give us more of that. Maybe that's what we do. But I love that he calls us together on this Sunday. I didn't know it was going to be July 4th. I didn't, I promise, when we started this. It's a patriotic, exciting, and here we go with Amos. Like, I didn't know. But, but, but maybe this is a wonderful opportunity for us to say, we, we want to make sure we're right with God. And we want to spend the rest of our lives here on planet Earth being just and being advocates for those who have no voice and doing what is holy and pleasing to God so that when they look at his church, when they look at his people, they see him and say, I want him. And Jesus said, if you lift me up and you make much of me, I will draw people to the Father. You just do what he calls you to do. So, so that's our declaration. Like that is a wonderful, hope-filled, God, we, that's our heart today. So here's what I want us to do. I, I want us to respond in prayer. And this is a prayer corporately for all of us, but for you as an individual, I don't know what you need to pray. So let me encourage you to bow your head and close your eyes for just a moment. That may eliminate distractions that are in the room, but I'm going to ask the worship team to come back to the platform. So you are going to hear movement if you're here in the room. If you're watching online, I want to encourage you to eliminate any distraction however you can.